Hi, my name is Lexi, and this is What You Should Know. So this is my first episode for this podcast, and I'm really excited to present for you all. To give you a rundown of who I am, my name is Lexi, and this is an Australian podcast. And the plan for this is we are going to discuss all kinds of Australian true crime and shocking aspects of history that you may or may not have known about. I know certain things I've never heard of, which is quite shocking to me because I've been born and raised in Australia my entire life. I've never left the country. My promise to you is to provide accurate and honest information with as minimal bias as possible. I will be putting my own opinion forward with it, but with that being said, it is just my opinion and you do not have to agree with me. But enough about me. What you need to know is about William Tyrrell. So who was William? William was born on the 26th of June, 2011, and at the age of nine months old was put into foster care with his older sister, who has been named by the papers as Lindsay. For legal reasons, we cannot name anyone, or at least no one close to this case. So for legal reasons, we will name his foster parents John and Jane. John and Jane had said that William was a vibrant, bright child who loved to play and had a smile that would just absolutely melt your heart. It was infectious if he was smiling. You would smile too. He would be curious but very shy and hold back with new people until he got to know them. Once he got to know someone, and if he liked them, he would be very affectionate and playful. Well, what happened with William? I'm going to be very honest. Maybe only one or two people in this world knows, and they have never come forward. So I'm going to walk you through what happened in the lead up on the day of. We're going to touch base on the persons of interest in this case. And from there, I'm also going to input some of my own opinions. Everything I have found is available on the internet, and you can find it yourself too if you want to further look into this. So let's get started with the timeline. On September 11th of 2014, Jane and John changed their plans to visit Jane's mother on the 12th, and they had decided to leave that day instead. This was planned as her father had passed away about six months ago, and she wanted to go up to help her mother with the large property she was living on. William was picked up from his daycare early, along with his sister, and they left for Kendall in New South Wales early that afternoon. Along the way, the family stopped at McDonald's, which later would be used to verify the timeline provided. Now, the thing I found quite odd with this is, outside of verifying the timeline, I could not figure out why this was consistently brought up in every single article I read. To the degree where the foster mother, Jane, had to come forward and defend herself, saying that it was a rare occasion treat. This is not something they would usually have. And to be honest, personal opinion on that one, it's quite rude to judge a parent for taking their kids to a fast food joint once in a blue moon. That night, they arrived late and settled into bed, with John sleeping in the same bed as William, and Jane settling into bed with William's sister, Lindsay. In the early hours of the 12th of September, William woke up, waking John up too. John made him breakfast and William watched a kid's show called Fireman Sam. Fireman Sam, for those who may not know of what it is, it's done in the same style as Thomas the Tank Engine. I'm pretty sure it's possibly made by the same people, to be perfectly honest, but the story just follows Fireman Sam as he comes to the rescue by being helpful and polite. About an hour later, Jane and Lindsay joined them. At one point that morning, Jane looked out the window and noticed two cars that seemed to be out of place, parked on the side of the road. This was strange because Benaroon Drive hosts houses that have extremely long driveways. So if anyone was visiting, they would have actually parked in the driveway to avoid unnecessary long walks to the house that they were visiting. The windows on the cars were down a bit, and no one was standing by the cars to suggest that there was any car trouble. Now with Kendall, it is a rural town. People are quite comfortable to leave their windows open and as it was September, the weather was warming up and there would be wants to prevent the car from becoming overly hot. Those who may live in a colder climate may not understand, but those who've lived in warmer climates, even outside of Australia, if a car is left closed up in this direct sunlight, 
chances are you'd be able to bake cupcakes in there. It's not what you would really want to be getting into, especially not by running the risk of then branding yourself with the buckle. A little later that morning, before the foster grandmother woke up, John went to a shopping complex to make a business call on Skype and to pick up a few things. Now, I was originally wondering why he would need to leave Benaroon Drive and go to a shopping complex to make a business call. Because to me personally, it does sound a little bit strange to be like, yeah, I am going to go to an open shopping center where anyone can hear me and there's going to be a world of distractions. Worse than what it would be to have children nearby. But the issue became the internet on Benaroon Drive was quite spotty and it would just be a lot easier for him to have decent connectivity while making that call. This also lined up quite well for him because he was then able to run a few errands such as picking up medications from the chemist. As the morning went on, it was time for the children to get dressed and William was insistent on wearing his Spider-Man costume. But as it was a cool morning, Jane spent minutes convincing this little boy to wear a t-shirt underneath. And after sorting through every other t-shirt they had, she managed to convince him to wear a Spider-Man t-shirt underneath. Because double the Spider-Man, why not? I know that's what kids like, and if he wants to be Spider-Man, then heck, he is going to be Spider-Man. Out the front of the house, Jane and the kids started to play a game called Mummy Monster, where Jane would chase the children while roaring. So this is kind of like a game of chasey, but louder. Jane ended up slipping on some leaf litter and she hit the ground, which led to her going inside to having to clean up, bringing the kids inside with her. While inside, the children made cards for their deceased grandfather that they were planning to leave on his grave. They were sticking pine cones and feathers and leaves to this card that they were going to leave on this gravesite just to let the grandfather know that they missed him dearly, which is quite sweet. Once done, the foster grandmother, who we cannot name for legal reasons either, but shall call June, asked the kids if they had brought their new bikes with them. Now, the kids were absolutely ecstatic to show her these new bikes. If you have children or if you have nieces and nephews or friends who have kids, you've probably seen them get excited to show off their new toy. Heck, if you've got someone who's enthusiastic about hobbying, you've probably seen similar. So they excitedly told her that they had and almost ripped her arm out of the socket by dragging her outside to show her their new bikes. Lindsay and William raced each other up and down the long driveway on their bikes. While racing, Lindsay had noticed and pointed out a car to her mother that had used the neighbor's driveway for a three-point turn, and the driver had looked down their driveway as they drove past. Now, this isn't too wild. It's a natural thing for people to look down driveways as they're driving along. They just want to make sure that a car is not coming or that they're not going to accidentally hit someone or an animal. It's mostly just road consciousness. The kids kept playing until they both ended up crashing, and June decided that they needed to go back inside. Now, what had happened with them crashing their bikes was Lindsay had lost control of her bicycle, and she did fall into a bush. William, wanting to be like his older sister, purposefully crashed his bike, and that's when the grandmother decided that was enough. Which is understandable, you don't want these young children that you're watching to end up hurt. So she did call them back inside. They ended up on the back porch. Lindsay was focusing on drawing pictures. And William started playing a similar game to Mummy Monster that he had called Daddy Tiger. Where he would then run around roaring at people. Now this is where that famous picture of William comes into play here. Where he is in Spider-Man pyjamas mid-roar, just having the absolute time of his life. Jane and June went inside to make a cup of tea. At this point, it's where Lindsay has said that he jumped off the side of the deck and ran around the front of the house. From inside, Jane heard William roar one more time, and then it was silent. She waited for a moment before checking, as she had assumed that he would be running around the house, but after a moment then decided to check on him. She stood outside, scanned the outdoors, looking for the red of his Spider-Man pyjamas, but could not find him. William was gone. She was probably inside for five, ten minutes max, on her mother's property where she would have grown up and known it to be a safe place. Country towns are safe places. You leave doors unlocked. You feel comfortable enough to let your car sit there with its windows down. 
You're not sitting there worrying about some person taking your child. And I can only begin to imagine the feeling of the pit of her stomach just dropping as she realised he wasn't there anymore. Jane searched inside and out, yelling William's name, but could not find him. Now, two streets away on Laurel Street, a resident called Mr Chapman went outside to check the mail. It was 10.45am and he saw an old boxy four-wheel drive speed recklessly down the street. The car was driven by a blonde woman and in the back he saw a little boy in Spider-Man pyjamas standing up without a seatbelt on. An iridescent blue car followed closely behind, driven by a man. Back on Benaroon Drive, Jane saw a neighbour sitting in her front yard having a cigarette and asked if they had seen William. The neighbour said no, but offered to help her look. It was at this point Jane had said that she thought someone had taken William. The neighbour, however, found this to be really odd, as it was mid-morning on a Friday. I can't speak for how parents feel if they can't find their child for a bit. I imagine in the first instance, you're going to look around the initial area, thinking they're just hiding, getting ready to jump out and do something silly. At the second point, I can't even begin to fathom what they would be feeling. So I'm not sure if it would be outrageous to claim that you think someone's taken him, or if that's a perfectly normal space to sit. The neighbour, however, then set down the road off to a bus stop that had a brightly coloured mural. And this was because she believed maybe, just maybe, William had in fact just toddled off, seen the brightly coloured bus stop and wanted to get a closer look. And how much of a nice thought is that? Finding the little lost boy there would have been a great place for this to end. Unfortunately, it's not. Jane went down the other part of the road towards the fire trail, where there were tall reeds and she heard a scream. She initially thought it was a child, but she called out and was scanning the area once again for that iconic red Spider-Man pyjama set. But there was no response, and she figured it must have just been a bird. Which, I can understand how some people would say that's probably ridiculous, but until you have heard a lyre bird, oh my goodness. Some of the sounds they come out with, they sound like a child screaming, or a car alarm. Heck, if you've even heard a wild fox randomly screaming, that is a terrifying sound. Jane wondered if perhaps John had come by and picked him up. At this point, she's obviously grasping at straws, just hoping for some logical explanation to explain to her where William had gone. Jane went back inside to check her mobile to see if there were any messages from her husband. The only message from him was to advise that he had finished what he was doing and was on his way home. Again, that feeling of the pit of the stomach dropping. I can't even begin to imagine how she feels. Jane ran outside again, just as John pulled up and asked if he had William with him. John went straight into action, looking for him, running around yelling out his name. Jane went back inside and called the triple zero emergency line to report William as missing. Ten minutes later, at 11.05am, the police arrived and launched the beginning of the biggest Australian missing person search since the Beaumont children. On the ground search, they went through houses and surrounding bushland. But this only lasted nine days when this was called off. Now, I'm not sure how long is normal for people to look for a missing child. And to be honest, children don't just disappear. If they do wander off, they usually don't even make it more than a kilometre before they are found. And that's even if it's days later. They don't make it that far. They are small and they have little legs and they're not going to get that far. Now, the first question I had in mind after reading through all of this was asking what happened with the cars that Mr. Chapman had seen. As for those two cars, Mr. Chapman didn't do anything when he saw them. Not when they were speeding. Not when he saw a little boy in danger in the back of that car without a seatbelt. He did nothing. It is in my personal opinion that that's appalling. Like, I would expect so much better from that and it's so disappointing that he didn't call it in because that is a child in the backseat in danger. Especially with how he was declaring that they were speeding. He said that one of them mounted a curb and the other one ended up going down the wrong side of the street, going at high speeds in a suburban area. Surely he would have called someone. 
or at least I would have hoped so. Mr Chapman saw the report about William's disappearance that night and decided to wait for the police to knock on his door as he had seen the detective on the news say that they were going to go door knocking in a one kilometre radius. However, Mr Chapman lived a kilometre and a half outside of that radius. It took a further two weeks for him to say anything to anyone. And even then, it was to a sister of a police officer rather than to a police officer themselves. He asked her to pass on a message for him rather than just going in. I'm My mind is still boggled at that. What kind of person sits there and realizes after two weeks, hey, the cops haven't come to speak to me. I should probably let someone know. Take 10 minutes to just go down and say, hey, I saw on the news what was happening. On that day, I saw this. However, the blame does not lie solely on Mr. Chapman in this because it took another six months for the police to interview him. Six months. I'm not sure if that is because they were inundated with people calling into the tip line or if they were understaffed or grossly unprepared for the reality that was William Tyrrell going missing. But it took that long and it's horrifying. Because if you ask yourself, what were you doing six months ago? I, first of all, would have to count back what month that was before I could even consider what I was doing at that point. Mr. Chapman has acknowledged that he did not go the right way about it and has been quoted saying, In hindsight, I should have gone sooner. You have second thoughts. I suppose I anguished a bit going forward. Anguished what? That statement brings more questions to me than answers. Was he wondering if he'd actually seen it? I mean, I can understand that, but maybe it was also a case of he anguished about whether or not he should go forward because he didn't see it, and he just wanted the attention. In October of 2020, it was suggested by forensic psychologist Dr. Helen Patterson that this could be a false memory. Dr. Patterson said information could be learned after an event had the potential to cloud or distort future retellings of the event. So what could the distortion in this memory be? On the same day William went missing, a woman passed through the same area driving in a four-wheel drive with one of her children also wearing a Spider-Man suit. Because let's be honest, William Tyrrell's not the only child that likes Spider-Man. Even though Mr. Chapman feels completely certain it was William in the car, not the other boy, there is a chance he was mistaken. And as promising as his witness account sounds, it has not led to anything. And we do need to keep in mind that witness testimonies are wildly unreliable. Other information they ended up looking into was... What about the cars that were seen parked on the side of the road? What Did anything come from that? The short answer is no. If anything, it brought up more questions than answers. No one has been able to identify those two cars, or the car that did a U-turn. Referring back to what Dr. Patterson had said, this could be a false memory muddled by the stress of that day. No one can blame anyone for being excessively stressed out when a child has gone missing. Again, I can't even begin to fathom that feeling and I hope nobody has to feel it. However, one neighbour did come forward stating that she did not see any cars on the road that day. While looking through this, I did end up looking to see whether or not they had brought sniffer dogs. It was widely reported that five days in, they did bring the police dogs in to see if they could pick up William's scent. This helped in ruling out that William did not in fact just wander off. However, the dogs could not pick up William's scent at all, not even on June's property. Investigators found this really strange considering how thorough they claimed the ground search to be. With sniffer dogs, however, it is much like people doing any other form of job. It's based on the individual. Reports say that the dogs that were brought in were veterans. But you can work a job for 12 months and be considered senior staff, so that really doesn't mean a lot to me personally. Research also shows that sniffer dogs are only accurate 25% of the time. Cadaver dogs, however, are accurate 95% of the time and can smell decomposition up to 15 feet underground. Now, a lot of people initially jumped at the thought that maybe 
maybe it was his biological parents, as they had been trying to get these children back through the legal system. However, that wasn't the case. It was proven with solid alibis, inclusive of CCTV footage that was timestamped, that his parents, who for legal reasons we still cannot name, so I literally went to a name generator and took the first two, so if by any chance I got this right, I am sorry, please don't sue me. <laughs> but we shall name the mother Bailey and the father Nick. But not only were the parents fully unavailable at that time and not in the area, it was the same for the remaining parts of that family as well. No one was available to take William. Now researching the case, I came up with quite a few issues. And with came up with, I mean, I faced them. <laughs> There are some issues that have really tripped up this case and potentially caused serious damage to whether or not William could have been located. Some of these issues have shaped how missing children are treated and others are more of a big eye roll. So in New South Wales, there's quite a few laws surrounding the foster care system, which is completely understandable. These laws and legislation are to protect the parties involved. So the Department of Communities and Justice will only share details with relevant departments and they will never share anything publicly. In this instance, this caused all kinds of confusions and issues with reporting the initial disappearance. John and Jane were referred as William's parents. The fact he was a foster child was hidden. In fact, I didn't even know he was a foster child until I started actually researching this case. On top of that, John and Jane could not publicly come forward with pleas for William to be brought back. This meant that they could not be humanised and cast doubt on their innocence in the court of public opinion. Other issues included the fact that the disappearance wasn't immediately treated as an abduction. I can understand why it wasn't. No one wants to believe that someone would take a small child. Even the neighbour had said she thought it seemed strange, as it was the middle of a morning on a Friday. Add to that, the initial statement is that he was missing, but this means the street was not preserved and taped off, so potential evidence was lost. Criminologist Dr. Xanthi Mallet has been quoted as saying police were initially looking for a child that had wandered off, which means the area was not forensically searched. People were allowed to leave the area. Cars were leaving the area. This strategy was lacking, and due to that, they possibly lost a lot of vital evidence. While this is tragic, it has led to changes in how missing children cases are treated. These changes have been attributed to the successfully locating the young girl, Cleo Smith, who went missing in Western Australia during 2021. Another issue became the frenzy that was a media circus. Police Commissioner Mick Fuller had come out saying that the investigation was a mess and wasted too much time on certain persons of interest. I agree with him there, and I will definitely be touching base on these persons of interest. But again, he is Police Commissioner. That means he would have signed off on everything that was happening. Other issues included rogue former detective Gary Jubelin being stood down from the head of the strike force after illegally recording conversations in 2017 and 2018. Jubilin does have his supporters who stand by him saying he did nothing wrong. However, as much as he was doing his best to do his job, he definitely did not go about it the right way. And that potentially caused more damage than necessary. But it does get better, and by better I mean worse. Between these two instances, it has become a skirmish of words between these two, where there are now full articles describing how terrible they think each other are. And it, it has been a circus. And as someone from the outside looking in, I kind of just want to sit them down and set them straight because they are genuinely distracting from the investigation which I am sure many people who've been following this are probably also getting annoyed at that as well. Listening to interviews with Detective Jubilin, it honestly plays out like a school bully that has finally been caught out. He said he does not see what he did as wrong and is more concerned at the vexatious way he is being pursued by the New South Wales police. Again, he's, he's calling it vexatious. 
honest opinion here, and again, it's my opinion, the way he pursued innocent people, claiming them as the person of interest and accusing them of doing horrible things to this poor little boy is vexatious. Recording conversations illegally is wrong. So he needs to take responsibility for that and stop trying to hide behind the I did what I had to do statement. If he wanted to do what he had to do, then he could have very easily gotten that approval. And if he didn't get that approval, chances are it was because he had very likely been told to step back and leave people alone. That being said, I don't specifically know how his unit works or how it goes through the chain of command to get what's needed. Now, with this comes a few issues as well. I'm sure most people are aware of the statement, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. This is another one where Jubilin pushed for this and it kind of caused this issue. He had requested a $1 million reward for the information that would lead to the return of William. Now, the intentions there were good and pure, and I understand the want to put something out there that would bring back those necessary results to be able to return this child to his family. But again, the road to hell is paved with good intentions, and Coles came flooding in, ranging from mildly helpful all the way to the wildly unfounded. Some of these would include William being taken out of the area in a wheelie bin, then dumped into an opal mining Cuba PD. Now, that isn't a short trip. Cuba PD is 2,269 kilometers away. Or, for those who like to use miles, 1,410. Another one was that William had been covered in concrete by someone who had been renovating I don't quite understand how that would have happened unless maybe they had abducted him, done terrible things, and then put him there to cover it. And that's honestly a horrible thought. Or the most ridiculous one that I've heard was that William was taken by a Yowie. Again, wildly unfounded. Included in these calls were people dreaming about William and claiming they were having psychic visions of where he was. For me, I do not feel like psychics and crime investigation really mix all that well. I say that namely because it either brings false hope or it causes unnecessary harm. That included and the fact that there is also a lot of money hungry scum that we do in fact call people and a million dollars is a lot of money. One instance of this in Australian history was when famed psychic Gerard Corset was brought into South Australia in 1966 to help locate the missing Beaumont children. Prominent estate developer Con Polites had paid handsomely for this to happen. Croisette claimed that the children had not been abducted but had been trapped below the concrete flooring of a warehouse that was being built. 30 years later, in 1996, the warehouse was demolished and excavated once again at Con's expense. But the children's remains were not found there. The psychic was wrong. Can you even begin to imagine how much money Con spent on trying to get those answers? And I personally find it unfair that he paid all of that out of pocket trying to get these answers for the parents of the Beaumont children just to have then been tricked. Now, with these few things, That's just the issues that I faced and saw within this. Let's jump into more interesting aspects of this. We're going to talk about the people of interest. While there were 600 people of interest in the investigation, we are going to look at four people of interest who were thrust into the spotlight. Now, we do need to keep in mind, these people have all been cleared at this point or they are still being looked into. So we do need to treat these people with a level of respect and understanding Because if they are guilty, the justice system will find them out. And it's not our business to go after people. The first person, which was the only person I remembered hearing about this when the case had broke, was Bill Spedding. The timeline for Bill on the day of William's disappearance proves his innocence straight away. So that's exactly where I'll start. Bill and his wife started their day by having breakfast and coffee at a nearby cafe. It was after this they then attended their grandchildren's school assembly at Lauriton Public School. 
After this, Bill walked down to his office to set up for a service call. He then ended up driving down to Dunbogen to complete this service call that he had booked in. Dunbogen is about 15 minutes away from Kendall, and at the time of the service call is when William went missing. So why was Bill looked into so deeply? And that's what we're going to find out. Three days before William went missing, Bill was on a service call at June's house for a washing machine. So that's the foster grandmother. Her washing machine had broken. She had called Bill to come fix it. He'd realised he didn't have the parts for her washing machine and said that he would be back in contact once he had the parts and he had to order those in. Bill wasn't surprised when the police called him because he knew he had been there. So Bill went to the police station to discuss his visit to Benaroon Drive. He did not bring a lawyer and he handed over his smartphone and his work diaries. Suffice to say, he was being completely cooperative. However, it was 2015 when the nightmare really started for Bill. The police came to the Spedding house to search for any items attached to William. Once again, Bill was completely cooperative and provided access without any protest. During the search, police found a Spider-Man toy in the back of his van. As I said earlier, Spider-Man is popular. William is definitely not the only child who loves Spider-Man. Bill claimed the toy belonged to his grandchildren that lived with him and his wife. The police were only satisfied with this answer after questioning his grandchildren and others, where they confirmed this fact. Which, again, I understand they need to scrutinise and check everything, but the suspicious behaviour is a bit daunting. I can only begin to imagine how Bill felt. But he was trusting because he knew he had nothing to do with what had happened. The police then asked Bill to come with them for questioning at the station. Bill agreed to attend and was taken to the station in the police car and still did not request a lawyer as he had nothing to hide and figured that this would be over relatively quickly. This, however, turned into a six-hour grueling interrogation by the lead detective of the time, Justin Moynihan. Before we go too far into what happened next, we need to take a step back to find out what triggered this nightmare. Days after William went missing, police received a call from a concerned citizen with a tip regarding a previous allegation that Bill Spedding had sexually assaulted two minors more than 30 years ago. And before anyone grabs their pitchforks, these charges were dismissed and thrown out at the original hearing back in the 1980s. And it was an unfounded claim. So back to the six hour interrogation. On the recordings I can find, you can hear Moynihan making harsh accusations and it honestly reminds me of when you would have an authority figure saying to you, if you didn't do it, then why are you defending yourself? It was abusive and bullying and scary and upsetting to listen to, so I can only begin to imagine how it must have felt for Bill. The story Moynihan was pushing was that Bill went to Benaroon Drive to complete the repair on June's washing machine, but saw young William around unsupervised. Then at that point, Bill decided to take the opportunity to abduct William and do all kinds of depraved things to him that eventually led to either William's death or being sold into a pedophilia ring. In my opinion, and this is in my very personal opinion, that is just lazy police work. They either decided to cling to the old allegations or they were under pressure to close the case as quickly as possible. This could have even been a case of this small town not being prepared for such a big case. And maybe they'd watched too many police shows for inspiration. If they had actually bothered to look into his alibi, they could have cleared him and moved on within days, rather than wasting as much time as they did. Where it went from bad to worse is when former detective Gary Jubilin took over. According to Bill, Jubilin had said to him, Mr. Nice Washing Machine Man, we're going to ruin you. It genuinely sounds like too much. Like, if you saw that anywhere, you would assume this was something out of a small child claiming that someone was bullying them. But reflecting on what we've already heard of Jubilant, I would not necessarily be surprised if this was true. While bullying, similar to that caliber, was taking place, 
child welfare authorities removed his grandchildren from his care. I have not since been able to find out whether those children were returned to him. But Bill is now suing the New South Wales police for how he was treated. The entire ordeal has pretty much destroyed his life and no doubt confidence in the police force. His business almost does not exist anymore and Bill lives in constant fear that someone who is misinformed with a vigilante complex is going to attack him. So to those of you listening, can you do me a favour? Promise you're not going to hurt him. He's done nothing quite literally. He wasn't even in the area at the time. The next person on this list is Paul Savage. He's almost not worth mentioning in my personal opinion. However, he is the cause for Jubilant's downfall. And for that reason alone, I am going to do a bit of a dive into this one too. Paul was 70 when William vanished. He lived across the road from June and had previously met the family at a Christmas party in 2013. Paul said at the party he noticed William following John around like a little shadow and commented on how good the bond between them looked. Which, of course you're going to notice that. You're going to be happy to see this child that you're aware of is in foster care bonding with its foster parents. You want happiness for kids. You don't want them to be suffering. So yeah, it's good to see a good bond and there's nothing creepy about that. The timeline for Paul goes as follows. On the day that William went missing, Paul went for a morning walk. He had tea and toast on his front porch. He then saw his wife off as she went on an outing. Paul then called the Casino Hospital, where his brother was being treated. Now this call ended around at 10.07 a.m. After Paul got ready, he then had something to eat and went out for the day. It wasn't until the initial search had started when Paul returned home. When he realized what was happening, he helped to search and cover more ground. He went in the opposite direction of everyone else to prevent double ups, which means he was going uphill. He was aware that it would be very unlikely for him to find anything because walking downhill is easier, especially for a small child. But once he had checked through the chunk of land, he went directly home thinking that hey, the police probably aren't going to need me. Which is understandable. He's not young, he's not found anything, and he wanted to go home. I do also understand that that does sound suspicious. But we do need to understand he's in his 70s. Now, years would pass. And in 2017, two years after losing his wife to cancer... Paul would be dragged into the spotlight as a person of interest. I want everyone to keep in mind that Paul Savage is currently 77, on his way to 78. He is an old man. Try to imagine the stress he went through. In 2015, he had to watch on helplessly as the love of his life died. And then he had to face the full force of Jubilant's abuse and onslaught of the media. All of that would be the strongest to crack it anyone. Now, bugs were planted in and around his house. Paul did end up finding one of the cameras and brought it inside, not thinking much of it. And it did, however, catch him talking to himself. Now, the issue is with these cameras, they are not great. I've looked at it. It does sound like what they're saying, they said. To which at points he's saying, don't let them get me, or you're just a little boy. But Again, if you don't pay attention and you don't consider the aspect of those being said, it could have also been something else. The police department then later planted a Spider-Man costume on one of his preferred walking paths. He did call in to let them know when he found it, and they still treated him like a suspect. There was hours of harsh interrogations where they would outright accuse him of lying. If you want to watch these videos of these interrogations, by all means, they are on the internet and they are accessible, but I do forewarn, they are hard to watch. The only reason I have found for Jubilant putting Paul in his crosshairs is because he lived across the road from June. The former detective believes that Paul accidentally hit William with his car and then hid the body. His belief in this theory was so strong that he broke the laws that he swore to uphold and led to him illegally recording three telephone conversations, and that is why he was stood down. So I guess the question then becomes, who's supposed to be policing the police? Because something obviously is not sitting right there. 
And even then, the next thing is, why did he decide to do this? Surely he would have known that there was a risk to illegally recording these conversations. Is it because he was classified as the detective you went to with a hard case to crack? Did he want to keep his stats good? Did it potentially go to his head? Or was he maybe feeling like he wasn't being heard by his higher-ups and thought that maybe, just maybe if he did it this way, he could get the answers he needed to close this case without it being an eternal struggle? At the end of the day, Paul has never been charged for anything, and his timeline shows that he was actually unavailable when William went missing. What further proves this is that Detective Sergeant Laura Beecroft has agreed that the calls to the casino hospital coincide with when police believe William went missing. Now, we are going to move on to the third person of interest here. This is a man called Frank Abbott. And, oh boy, where do I start with this man? Now, I use this term lightly because diving into his history shows what kind of monster he is. And honestly is one of the front runners for the most likely suspect in my personal opinion. Probably because he would be the easiest to blame with his history. But I will try to keep this brief, because you could honestly likely do a whole episode on this monster. One of Frank's best friends allegedly dobbed him in on his deathbed. I say allegedly because he is dead, and can no longer confirm nor deny what his nurse has come forward with. Ray Porter confided in a nurse named Kristen. According to her, Ray said he didn't do anything wrong. All he did was give his best mate and a little boy a lift. When Kristen probed further, asking Ray if he meant the little boy that went missing in Kendall, Ray confirmed it. According to what Ray allegedly said, he picked Frank and William up from behind the shed at the Kendall Primary School, which is about two and a half kilometers away, and from where William went missing. Ray then drove Frank and William 300 kilometers north. I have a problem with this because 300 kilometers is a long drive. I consider myself a generous friend and I'm willing to give my friends a lift up to 60 kilometers. But let's assume he was able to do 100 kilometers an hour the entire ride. That would still be a three hour trip. You're talking upwards of four hours considering traffic lights, traffic in general, and even speed zones. Because not everywhere is going to be 100 kilometers. That is a very, very long drive. And fuel, even back in 2014, was expensive. And what we need to keep in mind with that as well is Ray and Frank, they're both old. I don't say that to be rude, they are both pensioners. Frank only came forward to say that he had nothing to do with the disappearance or the murder of William. However, the late Ray Porter isn't the only one to come forward about Frank. Dean Anderson has said that Frank would say how he felt they were searching in the wrong spot to find William, followed up by saying Frank would always speak in riddles, and how this was such an odd statement because it was just so straightforward. Dean also said that Frank had mentioned something smelling dead in the bushland near Logan's Crossing. Dean felt shocked as Frank had approached him and said unprompted, there is a real bad smell in the bush. And it's not like a dead kangaroo. It's like a dead human being. Now, Dean's response is the most rational thing I have read throughout the research that I've done for this case. As he asked Frank, how the fuck do you know what a dead body smells like? But Frank may very well know what a dead body does smell like. As in 1991, he was charged with and went through the court hearing for the brutal rape and murder of 17-year-old Helen Harrison from Pitttown, New South Wales. Helen went missing on the 16th of March in 1968 while riding her bike home. Her body was found in a shallow grave in the bushland near East Currajong. The first jury could not come to a verdict. The second, however, unfortunately acquitted him. I almost wonder... How many people would still be alive who would still be with their family had he not been acquitted? Others have come forward recently saying that Frank would brag about how he dodged a murder conviction and would go on to boast about how he killed Helen. 
But why didn't these people come forward sooner to testify against him, you may be asking, because I sure know I was. Because Frank threatened to kill them if they ever came forward. Then why come forward now? I guess, would be the next question in this situation. Because Frank is serving a 17-year sentence for child sex abuse and will likely die in prison as he is currently at the ripe old age of 80. I wish that was all I read about this disgusting creature. But it honestly gets worse. A neighbour called Jody Huntley came forward saying she'd felt uncomfortable around him and did not want her children anywhere near him. She was even mortified to report that she had one day decided to follow her dog, Buddy, who she had noticed disappearing for random periods of time. Jody noticed that Frank would bribe Buddy into his caravan with bones and other assorted treats. She looked through his caravan window to see Frank performing sex acts on this poor dog. Now, at, at no point does it get better with Frank? Friends, acquaintances and co-workers have come forward regarding accusations of what he has done. Like the bludgeoning murder of Margaret Cox in 1996. Or the stunning coincidence of his son's death. Darren died at the age of three, coincidentally. The details of how are confidential. The records on that are sealed. But with all his misgivings, surely he has an alibi? Surely. Right? No. No, he does not. All reports state that he has been unable to provide the police with one at all. And to make things more suspicious, one of Frank's friends came forward because allegedly Frank kept telling him that he had an alibi for the Thursday and that the police couldn't do anything because he was getting his pension that day. When this former friend confronted Frank, telling him that William went missing on the Friday, not the Thursday, Frank told him the police must be wrong. Like, I, I can't even with Frank Abbott. I can't. He is disgusting. And I just, yuck, is all I can say about him is yuck. I don't know about any of you, but I feel like I need to wash my soul now. The only other thing that comes with this is I have not been able to find out whether or not Frank has been cleared. But that being said, as there is a coronial inquest still ongoing at this moment, I don't think we will find out until later. Now moving on to the fourth and final person of interest, that is the foster mother. The foster mother that we have named Jane made it to the role of sole person of interest in 2021. As this has only been a recent development, almost everything is speculative and is yet to be proven. Firstly, Jubilin feels as though he has already cleared both foster parents when he interrogated them and listened to the covert recordings where they expressed their displeasure for how they were treated and had some less than kind things to say about him. But if we start at the beginning, before William went missing, there are other things that don't sit right with me. Jane wanted nothing to do with William and Lindsay's birth parents and actively avoided them where she could. This is in stark contrast to when she later found out that Bailey was pregnant again and had asked her contact at the Department of Communities and Justice to offer Bailey help from her to babysit the new child if she ever needed a break. If you ask me, it's just weird. It's weird, it doesn't sit right, and I don't like it. Following this, Jane and John were in the process of looking to legally adopt Lindsay and William. Which isn't that strange on its own. They were in long-term foster placement and John and Jane seemed quite attached to them. However, Bailey was absolutely beside herself on the visitations when her children stopped referring to her and Nick as mum and dad, but instead as birth mum and birth dad, now referring to Jane and John as mum and dad. That being said, these are small children and it's probably just easier for them to be able to discern between the two. It doesn't make it any easier for them though. Another odd thing, which could just be a bizarre coincidence, is that a while before William went missing, he allegedly fell off of his bed and hit his face on the bedside table, leaving a particularly big bruise on his face. Now, I feel it is safe to say that small children are in fact quite clumsy. I am sure that people have watched their children trying to walk and fall over. I'm sure <laughs> there are 
There have been many, many trips to the emergency room of parents that are absolutely beside themselves because their kid lost their footing. So I'm not going to sit here and say that that's not the case of what happened. It's just something to consider. The reason this is being brought up, aside from the fact that it was mentioned in the book Missing William Tyrrell by Carolyn Ovington, but because in 2021, John and Jane faced charges of common assault against a minor. The judge decided that the information regarding the charges should be suppressed because it is not related to the William Tyrrell case and should be, and I quote, clickbaity in nature, which is understandable. But when you step back and look at the whole picture, it almost feels like something comes together. But again, this is still all purely speculation. And Jane and John should still be treated as innocent until they are proven guilty. What cemented Jane as a person of interest appears to be that infamous picture of William roaring while in his Spider-Man pyjamas. The same photo that was taken the day William disappeared and was used as proof of life. I am not sure how aware people are when it comes to data in pictures taken on a phone, but there are details embedded like time and date. It was initially claimed that the photo was taken at 9.37 a.m., but upon digital investigation, they can see that time was added as when it was edited. The photo was originally taken at 7.39 a.m. This leaves 118 minutes when nothing has been verified on what happened. And that is likely the new evidence that launched a new search in the Kendall area with the current theory that William may have fallen from a balcony, resulting in his death. Jane and June covered this up, allegedly, by disposing of the body nearby, taking up that 118 minutes all to avoid Lindsay. However, this would only prevent them losing Lindsay until 2021, when the assault charges were pressed. In this search, the New South Wales Police have excavated over 20 tonnes of dirt and drained a creek. Moving forward, what results have the search yielded? The answer really is, at this moment, nothing that can be confirmed to the public. Because again, that coronial inquest is still ongoing. They have found scraps of red fabric that they believed may be related to William's pyjamas. They found a replica gun, which they do not believe has any relevance, but it was relevant enough for the news to do a whole article on it. And they have found a bone fragment. Now, with a bone fragment, there is a lot that can go on with that. This bone could have belonged to an animal. It could have even been left over from someone's lunch, for all we know. But this isn't what I would call an overwhelming success. However, that being said, as I stated earlier, Coronial Inquest is still going. And I doubt they will be publicly revealing anything until they have the person responsible in prison. But even then, due to the laws and legislation surrounding New South Wales' ability to report on these things, they will not be able to name the person or what case it is related to, almost as if it's completely swept under the rug. Professor John Ollie, who I will put forward, he successfully helped locate what remains there were left of Daniel McComb has stated that we are unlikely to find remains of William, as it has been seven years. We are more likely to find his polyester Spider-Man pyjamas. Now, with everything that has happened, we do need to consider William's biological family. They are completely cleared of anything that would have happened. However, we need to also look at the grievances they have, because his family has felt pushed to the side, and completely forgotten. His biological grandmother, that we shall call Sheila, has said that she does not believe in the theory of William falling from the balcony. She has also said that she believed William to be dead since he went missing. She had also come forward saying that she was disgusted in the lack of communication between them and the police. With the first time that she saw Jubilant being at the coronial inquest, where he proceeded to completely ignore her, and walk straight by her. Sheila proceeded to say that the disappearance of William has all but killed her son Nick, who has spiralled. He's terrified to love his own children because he's scared the same thing will happen, and he doesn't want his heart to be broken like that again. 
Along with that, he has gone down a spiral where he has since been charged over 48 times with petty crimes, including drug offences, and he is now homeless. Nick and Bailey are no longer together. Bailey doesn't want sympathy. She just wants answers to what happened to her baby boy. She has also lashed out against the foster parent, saying, She went inside to make a cup of tea. If that's the cause, like, okay, that's an accident. And that's unfortunate. But it doesn't make sense to me. Kids just don't go missing. And I have to say, Bailey is right. Kids don't just go missing. Now, the last thing I do want to touch on is William's older sister. Lindsay was five years old when William went missing. Now, let me tell you, Lindsay is no wilting flower. And she is going to grow up a strong, fierce woman. Someone to truly be proud of and admire. In 2020, when Lindsay was 10, she spoke at the coronial inquest. And wow, all I can say is strap in. Her words exactly were, this is my brother we're talking about. In my mind, no one is trying. So I have made a decision to do something about that. To talk. When I'm officially an adult, I will be in the police force. A detective specifically. And I will not give up until he is found. To no end, I hope she doesn't have to become a detective to find out what happened to her brother. I'm hoping an answer will be given. I'm hoping that he will have justice. And I'm hoping people will be brave enough to come forward and tell us what happened. So with that being said, that is all the information I have for you today. If you do happen to have information on this case, please contact Crime Stoppers at 1-800-333-000. But for now, that is all. Stay safe and stay hydrated. If you want to reach out to me and see any pictures that I post regarding this case or my future cases that I will be covering, you can follow me on Instagram at what you should know Australia. Or if you want to reach out to me specifically, you can reach out to me at what you should know Australia at gmail.com. Yeah.